So I'm an environmental chemist and I'm interested in the fundamental behaviour of radionuclides in the environment and that can be complex environments or natural environments. My family are not scientists as background so uh, it was an interesting choice for me to make and with time I got more keen on science. Um, I think curiosity always is part of the process of being a research scientist uh, and I hope I was curious as a kid. There are always influences uh, that you reflect on that might have impacted you know, your ch career choices. Some of the things I did at primary school even might, might have planted that seed. I did some projects, uh, little posters, talked about people uh, and one of the people I, I talked about was Marie Curie and to help me with this my mum and dad bought me the Marie Curie Ladybird book which those of us that are of a certain age will understand what a Ladybird book was and then years later actually I was rooting through through my mum's uh, cupboard uh, and I found it there and I just there was just a flash of I wonder is that an influence on my life who knows whether it is clearly as a woman scientist then having somebody like Marie Curie, even at, at primary school, is, is really influential potentially. You know, you have to see people to emulate people. I think I was 15 or 16, 1986. Uh, Chernobyl happened and um, there was quite a lot of coverage or there was a lot of coverage. My mum and dad had been out in the Lake District uh, walking and they came back and the news was all about how um, how this cloud of uh, radioactive contamination had come over from the Chernobyl incident over in, from New Northern Europe and it had rained in the north and they, they I can remember them you know being a little bit um, quiet maybe and there was quite a lot of um, fear around the incident uh, and also I, I, I had that but I was also quite curious about it and when I went to Manchester a couple of the people at Manchester had been involved in measuring some of the um, Chernobyl rain uh, in the centre of Manchester and, and talked it through and, and that was really really again it, it spurred my curiosity about about how to detect things how that environmental trace had come over how damaging it was or otherwise. It's another one of those little seeds, isn't it? So uh, my PhD was about understanding how radionuclides behave in the environment, whether they're mobile or not, what might be controlling that. Um, and that involved me going out and getting a piece of the environment that was had anthropogenic radionuclides in it which involved me going out to a, a pretty well-known salt marsh in West Cumbria and I was wielding a shovel and some tide times in order to be able to go and sample safely and get my sediment back to the lab. And then I spent most of the rest of my PhD analysing the radionuclides that were present in there and inferring uh, their mobility behaviour uh, and doing quite a lot of careful separation chemistry to get the radionuclides out of the bulk of the, the, the salt marsh itself. The radionuclides are present at very, very vanishingly small concentrations. So we still go out into the environment and, and get the sediment or the materials that we're interested in. But instead of allowing the natural environment and this kind of natural laboratory that people use to describe the real world, we take our uncontaminated materials into the lab and then add radionuclides that we're interested in in a more controlled fashion and then we can add for example reagents that we think will act to um, precipitate them out in that environment and then we can um, control the concentration of radionuclides, control what we call the biogeochemistry of the system which is the way that it's behaving so we can push it in particular directions that sometimes in the environment it would go into but we're perhaps promoting it or exploring those changes in a lot more detail. And the other thing it lets us do, uh, which is relevant to synchrotron light source, is it lets us control the concentration of the radionuclides because we need elevated concentrations, comp thankfully, compared to those that you find in even uh, uh, my salt marsh that I did in my PhD. 
what we're trying to think about now is whether we can go into some of these natural laboratories and use some of the more brilliant synchrotron techniques to start picking apart the real environmental systems to tally back to our controlled experiments. So the first time I used synchrotron was after my PhD. I'd been a research scientist for a few years and uh, I'd become aware that you could use synchrotrons to look at radioactive contaminants. So we wrote a grant, got that funded and arrived at the synchrotron. And Daresbury in those days was the mix between, I guess, the Starship Enterprise and a shed. And I reflect on how things are now compared to then. And it really was this mix between uh, frontier of science uh, very heavily instrumented rooms, um, writing scripts in order to kind of position your sample, working with the beamline scientists in order to just sim simply understand how to do the experiment. I can remember, you know, really having to kind of almost think through uh, a whole host of steps in order to to get the beam onto the sample to get the to get the data out. But also walking around the ring, you, you, you know, there were bits where you, you, you got the weather <laughs> in between. In some ways very different, but we still do the same. We still do the same science. We're using advanced, uh, more brilliant light sources. Uh, we're using a whole host of different things. And, you know, uh, we sleep better now, I'd say. <laughs> So radioactively contaminated land is a, a, a side effect, if you will, of running a, a nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, there are leaks and spills and there are also things like um, neutron activation of cement and rebar in the subsurface near the nuclear reactor. So there are a range of radionuclides in, in contaminated land systems. And one of the things that we've done over the years is focus on, first of all, how the radionuclides are behaving in the contaminated land, what their chemical form is, whether we can predict whether they're mobile. But the other thing that we can do is also generate what we call a toolkit of kind of remediation approaches. Often with radioactively contaminated land in the UK, that it, it's present in the subsurface, shallow subsurface, um, and often on very congested, like busy sites with lots of buildings on. So actually digging things up in a big way is really problematic. So we, we've done quite a lot of research into chemical and biological treatments where you can inject things into boreholes to precipitate out radionuclides. Then they're not mobile in the groundwater and therefore uh, they're a reduced risk at that point. In some cases, the radionuclides undergo radioactive decay to stable elements. So at that point, you've got something that you can work with. You know where the radioactivity is. And if time allows, you can allow radioactive decay to, to solve the problem, as it were. In other cases, they might be too radioactive. Uh, but if they're held, then at least you know where the problem is and you can uh, go in to remediate. Um, and I'm saying this as, uh, I think it's a toolkit. We're learning how to do these things, so we know about the radioactive contamination uh, and we know that we'll need a range of different things in order to be able to manage it in the future. When you run a nuclear fuel cycle, you, you generate liquids which have radioactivity present in them. And there's a whole different range of effluent treatment operations, if you will, they're the kidneys of Sellafield um, operate in different ways and we've done quite a lot of work around further optimising effluent treatment at the site. The successes uh, that we've had have been founded on a relationship between Sellafield, the academics at the University of Manchester and our colleagues at the National Nuclear Laboratory. So we've done the kind of fundamental underpinning research about iron behaviour, for example. We've been really, really successful at translating knowledge and getting our fundamental underpinning science into plant scale changes. And that has caused a further reduction in the very low level discharges already, but we've reduced those further by up to 60%, cleaned up discharges going out to the Irish Sea. So the story comes full circle from me and a shovel to me helping and working with the industry collaborators uh, in order to uh, really achieve further reductions and, and better environmental outcomes.
the kind of internationally accepted way of management of these materials is, is this process called deep geological disposal. Um, the UK is now actively seeking uh, a site for deep geological disposal. In terms of the, what that is, something, shall we say, five to six hundred metres under the subsurface uh, with uh, engineered vaults and with the radioactive waste going in in packaged waste forms and then surrounded by a backfill and then an engineered vault system to create what's called a multi-barrier system to radioactive um, mobility in the subsurface. So the idea is to retain the radionuclides uh, for very long times in the subsurface. In terms of the fundamental underpinning science, that's where I, uh, that's where we live, our, my group and, and my colleagues live. Um, and so you can imagine there are questions about the engineered waste and how it evolves with time. So it's always back to that environmental chemistry thing that, that, that's my area of interest. So if you place uh, cement in the subsurface and there's a uh, radioactive grouted waste in a steel container, you know, over tens of thousands of years, how that corrodes, how the water gets in, what the water does, how that evolves with time and, and how the radionuclides are retarded through that process and ultimately um, with longer geological times that you need for some of the long-lived radionuclides then uh, you know as those long-lived radionuclides move into the host rock what their behaviour is uh, in those systems. We've also got other projects looking at the way that microbes may be present in those um, quite extreme engineered environments and uh, how they might affect the radionuclide behaviour. We're trying to understand whether the microbial geomicrobiology of the system, the microbial processes that may operate in that system, uh, impact on radionuclide behaviour. Um, uh, interestingly, most of the microbial processes that we've looked at so far actually enhance the radionuclides being retained in, in the engineered barriers systems. And, you know, let's recognise this is probably uh, mid-century and it's uh, uh, opening and it's probably, you know, 100, 200 years opening uh, to receive all the uh, radioactive materials it needs to receive. So, so we're learning, we're developing skills um, and we're asking, starting to ask questions about those scenarios. The benefit that synchrotron light source gives us is that we can contain our sample so that we know that it's kind of contained within layers and we can use the very bright light to penetrate through those layers safely and to give us the speciation information in the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, the chemical bonding of the radionuclide in that system. So it could be adsorbed onto a surface of a mineral or it could actually be locked up in that mineral structure and the synchrotron allows us to understand that and even it allows us to kind of play with optimising those processes so if we want it to be locked up in the mineral phase so that it's really tightly bound and won't move we use kind of some of the remediation techniques that I've talked about and we can test whether what we think is going to happen is going to happen at the synchrotron light source so we can't, we can't get that information um, clearly in any other way and we use synchrotrons as part of our analytical toolkit. Even though we have to go to this central facility, go through all these pro processes, actually for radioactive samples it's quite an agile technique because we can bring it in in a little containment that's overwrapped, we can shine the light on it, we can collect our data and then we can simply take that containment away which is completely coherent, very safe, no, no issues uh, and move it back to the labs in Manchester for, for further work. We're working with a range of different universities, Sheffield, Leeds, Bristol, um, to, to kind of grow that community and that's been really, really exciting. And then more recently, Diamond, um, working with that community, uh, put forward the idea for an active materials laboratory for working with radioactive materials uh, on site. Typically we would have kind of shipped things from, from the labs in Manchester. What the new lab uh, at Diamond Light Source allows, we're still finding out, okay? So it's, it's really interesting to explore this. But for example, for the low radiotoxicity uraniums of this world, 
we can do experiments on site and, and resolve time over, you know, if an experiment takes a few hours to react, to stick to a surface or react in some other way, we can actually do that experiment at Diamond and take time points and analyze it on the synchrotron in various different techniques, uh, you can imagine. We can also work in situ experiments on, on the beamline, so we can practice in the labs with uranium, for example, and then take an experiment and, and do a, like a, 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 an experiment on the beamline itself. But then other of, others of my colleagues, uh, for example, a colleague at Bristol's talked about actually doing long-term experiments with radionuclides at Diamond. So you know, kind of starting an experiment in the lab and then waiting a year and then pulling it out of the lab, putting it on the beam line, putting it back into the lab, waiting another year. And so that kind of thinking is coming in. So we're really exploring how to, how to, how to use that capability. It's really exciting. So the amount of things that we need to look at is only going to get bigger over the next decades. And so the, the lab at Diamond is like a solid foundation for that expansion and that capability change, that step change in, in understanding that, that we need to develop as, as, as we understand contaminated land management, as we understand uh, further effluent treatment processes for kind of future effluents at Sellafield as we understand deep geological disposal and as we move towards the site uh, potentially you know more more tailored experiments to those systems so it it's a foundation for us to build that community and really use those techniques as part of our toolkit analytical toolkit that we use um, to to look at the behavior of radionuclides in these complex environmental systems When we're thinking about radioactive waste in the broad sense, you know, effluents, contaminated land, deep geological disposal, shallow disposal, all of these techniques, uh, I think it's interesting to think about the scale of the challenge. So currently the estimate is that it's going to take more than 100 billion pounds to clean this nuclear legacy up and it's going to take more than 100 years. And we need to challenge that and we need to innovate to try and make that um, as time short and money constrained as possible, if it is possible, but always within safe constraints. So you can clearly see that if, you know, in a process, if you can knock uh, five years off a decommissioning cycle at Sellafield, the potential for savings there, both monetary and, and environmental, is quite significant. So, you know, innovation, training people to be able to understand these things and translate that into innovation is has a real societal, direct societal benefit, I think. One of the things I, I think I find myself doing more and more is thinking about the skills for the future. So training people, bringing people to synchrotrons, bringing people into our environment where we use microbes, where we use microbial techniques, minerals, where we use you know, mineralogical techniques, geochemistry, and synchrotron light source to, to understand these the behavior in these complex environments is really part of part of what we're trying to achieve and, and you know i think making people that can use these techniques and answer these challenges as they emerge over the next decades is going to be really important